Greetings, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program. Before we turn it over to Mr. Williams, who will be emceeing for us tonight, just a couple of housekeeping items. All attendees, uh, we'd like to welcome you, and we appreciate you joining us this evening. Um, everyone's microphones are muted. Um, this is a webinar for those who are familiar with the Zoom feature. So as we proceed with our uh, speakers tonight, um, if you have questions during a Q&A session, then you can use the Q&A feature, which if you were to uh, mouse over at the um, either the top or the bottom of your screen when your controls come up to, um, you know, for your video and to see the participants and um, there's a Q&A feature, and that's where we ask that people put any questions, and then therefore our presenters will be able to monitor that and answer your questions, hopefully. And if we don't get to them, then um, you know, we will monitor those and try to uh, get an answer for you as quickly as possible. So again, we will get ready to get started with our program here shortly. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, James Williams. I um, am a, a native or resident now of Carborough, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to Carborough's uh, Black History Month program, the first one of several it will be having this month. And our program, this evening I'm really excited about um, is focused on George H. White, a phenomenal figure that too little is known about, not just within the state of North Carolina, but nationwide. And so we're gonna focus on George White uh, this evening one of the things that I, I do want to tell you in the beginning, it was either five or 10 years ago, and um, I can't remember. So it was either 2011 or 2016, I attended an event at the Century Center in Carborough. It was uh, hosted or sponsored by the Orange County Human Relations Commission. And the uh, program was either on immigration or him, human trafficking, I can't remember which. But I do know that uh, it was around the anniversary of the speech that uh, George H. White gave on January uh, 29 of 1901. And that's why I say it was either 2011 or 2016 because uh, I, I realized that it was the either the 110th or the 115th um, anniversary of that speech. And so after the program, when they got to the Q&A part of the program, I didn't have a question, but I did make a statement that I felt um, it would be appropriate, uh, especially at a program regarding human rights that we acknowledge the anniversary of the speech given by George H. White. And a number of people approached me after my comment and most of them had no knowledge of George H. White, didn't know who he was and asked questions like, well, why didn't we know, why don't we know about him? But I think even more significantly, there were two people, a man and a woman who approached me and they thanked me for lifting up George H. White. They said they were from Durham and they said that they were descendants of George White. And that moved me in a very special way. And so I knew that when the opportunity arose, I want it to be a part of, in some way, a program regarding 
this remarkable man and what he has meant to the quest for justice in this country. And so I am very thankful to the town of, of Carborough for hosting this program this evening. Um, I want to thank, uh, obviously, the mayor and the town council, Charles Harrington, who you just heard from, Anita Jones McNair, and, and Karina Riley, all have been, who have been um, instrumental in helping us move this program forward. So um, now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our first speaker and who's someone who really doesn't need a lot of introduction. And it is no other than Congressman G.K. Butterfield. Congressman Butterfield is a native of Wilson, North Carolina. You know, we sometimes call it down east, that part of the state, or sometimes we call it the 252. Um, I'm a native of Eastern North Carolina myself. Congressman Butterfield, um, his parents uh, were involved in the civil rights struggle. He, uh, his father, in fact, uh, who was a dentist, actually ran for and eventually was elected to the um, town council of, of the, or city council of Wilson. And this was during the Jim Crow era. So as a youth, Congressman Butterfield had a, a seat front and center uh, regarding the civil rights movement here in the state of North Carolina. And he was involved at an early age. He attended North Carolina Central University undergrad school, but I believe in his junior year, he was drafted into the armed services. Upon being honorably discharged, he returned to North Carolina Central where he completed his undergraduate degree and went on to law school and um, got his law degree, uh, passed the bar. And for around 14 years or so, he was a trial, a lawyer here uh, in North Carolina with the primary focus or a heavy focus on civil rights cases, including voting rights cases. Um, he eventually was elected to the Superior Court of North Carolina, where he served for, I believe, 13 years. In 2001, he was appointed uh, to the Supreme Court of the state of North Carolina. In 2004, he went on to be elected to the Congress of, of uh, the House of Representatives. Um, and he has served in that capacity since that time, he has served in numerous leadership roles and it would take uh, too long to go over all of his accomplishments. I do want to mention though that uh, I am, another reason I'm so pleased to have him as part of this program is like, like me, I think there's a passion, there's a love uh, for history, and there's no doubt in my mind that Congressman Butterfield is a historian without a portfolio or without that PhD degree. Um, he uh, also, if you've read uh, Benjamin Justinson's book, uh, An Even Chance in the Race of Life, Congressman Butterfield does the uh, the forward, I believe it is, to that book. So he certainly is, is recognized, not just by me, but by a number of others uh, for his, not only his passion, but his knowledge of history, particularly African-American history. So without further ado, I will turn this over to U.S. Congressman G.K. Butterfield. Wow, thank you so very much for those very kind and generous words of introduction. Uh, let me just say in the outset, James, that you contacted me last year about this program, uh, <laughs> even before I knew my schedule for 2021. And so thank you for, for extending the invitation and thank all of you for participating tonight. Uh, I especially want to thank the mayor and the other town officials for the town of Carborough, uh, for without you, tonight would not have happened. And so thank you very much for 
understanding the importance of this conversation. And it's good to see uh, my dear, dear friend, Dr. Ben Justine, who, who wrote the book on, on the life of George H. White. Uh, ben and I developed a friendship some 14 years ago, I guess it was, and, and our friendship continues uh, even to this day. And to the panelists who have consented to participate this evening, I look forward to, to your words, uh, particularly to the Cheatham White Scholars. It's good to know that you are doing the work that you are doing. Uh, thank you for, for honoring the, the rich legacy of George H. White, 120 years, January 29th, 1901. And as all of you have kind of figured out by now, I represent the district, the congressional district that George H. White represented at the turn of the 19th century. Uh, when George White represented the district, it was the second district, and now it's referred to as the first congressional district. As I tell the story of George H. White, I always begin by, by making it a point that he was born in 1851. Uh, that was 13 years before the end of slavery. And so when, when, when Abraham Lincoln was running for president in 1860, George White was nine years old. Uh, the Southern plantation owners were fearful. They were very fearful of Lincoln because they thought Lincoln would, if elected, uh, deprive them of their slaves. And so there was great resistance from the South in the 1860 presidential election. Abraham Lincoln won the election. And immediately after his election, seven Southern states succeeded from the Union, even before he was inaugurated. Now, Lincoln was inaugurated on March 4th of 1861. Today, it's January 20th when we inaugurate presidents, but back then it was March 4th. Uh, when, when President Lincoln was inaugurated, four more states left the Union. That was a total of 11 states leaving the Union, and these states formed the Confederate States of America. That was the beginning. That was the the onset, if you will, of, of the Civil War, the war between the North and the South. And you know, when 1863 came along, thousands of soldiers on both sides of the battle line were losing their lives. And finally, on January 1st of 1863, Lincoln issued that profound pro uh, emancipation proclamation in his attempt to end slavery. But as lawyers uh, know, and those who follow government know, uh, an Emancipation Proclamation is an executive order. Uh, it was done under the signature of the president as a commander in chief, but there was great doubt about the legality of the proclamation and whether the proclamation would survive the war. And so when the war finally came to an end in, in 1865, the first thing Lincoln did uh, was to propose a 13th Amendment, which legally ended slavery in America. And the 13th Amendment was ratified by the requisite number of states. And on December 6, 1865, uh, the 13th Amendment was added to the Constitution. And then it was the 14th Amendment, which granted citizenship to the former slaves. And then there was the 15th Amendment, which gave the slaves, the former slaves, the right to vote. And that's when George H. White stepped forward. He was a smart young man. He was from southeastern North Carolina. By this time, he was some uh, 19 or 20 years of age. <clears throat> he educated himself, became an attorney, uh, moved to Newburgh, North Carolina, and that's where he set up a law practice and actually became the district attorney. Uh, during those days, it was referred to as the solicitor. He was the, the top lawyer in his area. Uh, and there were rumors that that White was going to run for Congress. He was elected to the state legislature in Craven County, but there were rumors that he would run for Congress. And that's when the lines were manipulated and he was, it, it was uh, fixed so he could not run for Congress, at least to, to put him at a disadvantage uh, for running for Congress. And that's when White left Newburn, Craven County and came up to Edgecombe County, North Carolina, which was the, the home of, of his wife. Uh, he moved, his wife was named Coralina Cherry. Uh, he moved to uh, Tarboro, Edgecombe County, uh, married to a very prominent man's daughter, uh, Mr. Cherry, who uh, was very prominent during those years. And that's when, when he continued his political quest. Well, as time went on, John Hyman uh, was elected to Congress in 1874. Uh, John Hyman was from Warren County. 
uh, Hyman was African American, he served one term. And then it was not until 1882 that another African American was elected, James Edward O'Hara. O'Hara was a very smart lawyer. He had moved from the North to the town of Enfield. And James O'Hara ran for and was elected to Congress in 1882. But he only lasted for one term. And then in 1888, a fellow by the name of Henry Plummer Cheatham. Uh, Cheatham was from the Oxford Henderson area of North Carolina. Uh, Cheatham was, was a very educated man. He was very smart, very talented, ran for Congress, and, and he won in 1888. Uh, Henry Plummer Cheatham, you might know, uh, was, was married to, this, to uh, a young lady uh, by the name of Louisa Cherry, who was George H. White's wife's sister. Uh, and so they were brothers-in-law, if you will. And so Plummer Cheatham served, Henry Plummer Cheatham served two terms in Congress. But by this time, African-Americans and, and Republicans, which is what Democrats were registered as during those days, uh, African-Americans and Republicans were losing ground politically. Uh, there was a great insurgency. There was a great uh, effort to disenfranchise Republican voters and African-American voters. And so in 1892, Cheatham lost the election and a white congressman was elected. In 1894, Cheatham ran again and lost the election. And in 1896, Cheatham came back again and wanted to run. And that's when George H. White confronted his brother-in-law and, and said to his brother-in-law, it's time for you to step aside and allow me to run for Congress. And the two men uh, had some degree of dispute. Uh, but when the dust settled, George H. White did run for Congress in 1896 and was he, was, he took office in 1897, continued in that position for the next four years. But something interesting started to happen around 1898. Uh, that's when there was the, the infamous Wilmington race riot. Uh, black people in Wilmington were very politically active and the Klan went into Wilmington and, and with great destruction, uh, destroyed the town and and, and hurt and killed so many and, and ran out of town, many of the African-American elected officials in Wilmington. That was the 1898 Wilmington race riot. But African-Americans continued to have a, a quest and interest in, in getting involved in, in the electoral process. And so in order to fully disenfranchise African-Americans, in 1900, the North Carolina General Assembly uh, used the nuclear option, as I like to call it. They went into session and enacted a law that basically said that in order to register and vote, you had to be able to read, write, and understand the Constitution. It was called a literacy test. And you had to be able to satisfy the registrar, who was always white, that you were a literate individual. And so because of the literacy test being put on the books and in, in 1899 and 1900, African Americans were essentially uh, disenfranchised and not allowed to continue to, to vote and to participate in the electoral process. And so George White understood the gravity of the moment. Uh, he understood that he would not be able to be reelected in, in 1900. Uh, instead, he decided to, to uh, retire or step aside from the Congress of the United States. But on January 29th of 1901, he made that infamous, a very famous speech, uh, the, the uh, Phoenix, I will rise again. And I'm sure Ben Justine will talk about it later in the program. That's when he made that famous speech. So often as I sit on the house floor uh, with my colleagues, uh, once in a while we start talking about reconstruction. Uh, and I, I always quickly mention the fact that George H. White uh, stood right over there. And I used to point it out to my colleagues because we sit typically on the front row and, and the speaker's lectern is like 10 steps from where we sit. And I often remark to my colleagues, right there, right there, colleagues, that's where George H. White made his famous speech on January 29th, 1901. Uh, that was, I, I encourage you, I urge all of you to read that speech. It's, it's rather lengthy, but it is very, very informative. And that's why the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation has now named its most coveted award, the Phoenix Award. And we present an, an, that, that award every year during our annual legislative conference, the Phoenix Award. 
And so I want to thank you. Thank you so very much for your interest in this subject. Uh, thank you for your willingness to, to sign on this afternoon, this evening, and to listen to the presenters and to listen to me ramble for the last 10 minutes and 40 seconds. Uh, but this is a very interesting topic that I hope we will understand and appreciate and pass it on to future generations. Thank you so very much for having me this evening. Congressman um, Butterfield, could I ask you one question before you step away? Certainly. If you let um, me take a, take a swig of water. Sure, go right ahead. Uh, thank you for much, so much for your, your, your enlightening remarks, but I did want to, I think I read somewhere that there has been a bill introduced to have a stamp or something named after George White, or am I misremembering? I have it right here and I had failed to mention it. Okay. <laughs> My staff told me to make sure that I mentioned it and I, and I did not, but I did, uh, I have offered a, a bill uh, to, um, and I have quite a few co-sponsors to commemorate the life of George H. White with a George H. White commemorative stamp. Uh, that bill has been introduced into Congress. We're gonna to try to get it uh, passed and get it over to the Senate and get the Senate to pass it and hopefully to get President Biden to sign it uh, within the next two years. But it is an active bill in the US House of Representatives. I'm looking for the bill number. I don't see it at this moment, but it's easy to find online. The George Henry White Commemorative Stamp Act. Thank you for reminding me. Well, thank you so much for joining us and for providing us with that, uh, that history lesson and those in informative remarks about this remarkable man, George H. White. Thank you. Really appreciate it. So um, without further ado, we will move to our second uh, presenter, and that is uh, Mr. Ben Justinson, Professor Ben Justinson, who uh, is a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is a native of uh, Dunn, North Carolina. He majored in English at UNC and actually began work as a newspaper reporter following his, his graduation in Eastern North Carolina. And it was in that capacity that he initially began uh, uh, to find out some information related to George H. White, which um, sort of inspired a quest for knowledge, for more information about uh, Mr. White. Uh, and so as a result of that, um, Mr. Justinson uh, did uh, go on to to graduate school um, and to do further work. Um, I think if I remember correctly, he had planned to do his uh, dissertation on George H. White and had done quite a bit of work on that, but uh, for whatever reason uh, decided not to. But he eventually did get back uh, to writing about George H. White um, and he did a book in 2001, um, actually it was Pulitzer Prize nominated biography, George Henry White and Even Chance in the Race of Life that was published um, in 2001 and reprinted in 2012. He has uh, written actually a couple of other books involving George H. White, his most recent book, and uh, will be the topic of some discussion tonight. Also, Forgotten Legacy, William McKinley, George Henry White, and the Struggle for Equality. Um, I was uh, just, just speaking with uh, then Dr. Justinson before we came on air, and I know that there had been a plan by Flyleaf Books, which is a local bookstore, to host him this fall after the, well, last fall, the fall of 2020. Uh, but, you know, obviously COVID uh, put an end to, uh, to that. And so um, let's welcome Mr. Justinson uh, to speak with us in more detail about a man that he probably knows more about than anybody else in the country. Um, 
Mr. Ben Justinson. Mute myself. Hi, thank you, James, um, for that kind introduction. Uh, also, let me thank the town of Carborough for allowing me to uh, help out in this Black History Month presentation. A special thanks to Karina Riley and Charles Harrington and Carborough's town staff for making it happen. And many thanks to James for suggesting I be invited. You're on my A list now. <laughs> A special thanks to my good friend, Judge Butterfield, Congressman Butterfield, for encouraging so many to deepen their understanding of his predecessor, George White. Being here even virtually is a double blessing, helping spread the word about the legacy of a man whose life I've spent decades exploring, George Henry White, and a nostalgic return to familiar surroundings. As an undergraduate at uh, UNC, I lived my junior year in Carborough at the Chateau Apartments out on 54 West. So it's a little bit like coming home. That was in 1969 when I was a budding journalism student. Never heard of George White. In 1975, when I worked for the Fayetteville Observer as a reporter, a press release came in about a North Carolina Museum of History exhibit on him. He was not covered very well, if at all, in the history books I studied in the mid-20th century, so I began digging into his life or what became my first book in 2001. Forgotten Legacy is uh, the fourth book in a series dealing with the life and times of George White and his contemporaries, closing out my pursuit of a side of American history few people seem to know very much about these days. That's black office holders in the post reconstruction era, 1877 to 1900. Forgotten Legacy is also my take on the long overlooked alliance and friendship between George White and William McKinley, who got little historical credit for his efforts to help African Americans. He appointed more blacks to federal office, postmaster up to US minister than any predecessor after the Civil War, perhaps more than all of them combined. He trusted his black advisors and actually listened to them. He welcomed hundreds of black visitors to his White House offices day after day, year after year. McKinley was an extraordinarily decent man who cared for all Americans, both races, and he showed patience and understanding for black needs in a way that few American leaders ever have. African Americans voted for him overwhelmingly, those that could, because they sensed in him a true friend. In much of what William McKinley accomplished, it grew out of that friendship with George White, but knowing White, did not propel McKinley into taking those actions. They were almost inevitable, given his personal sympathies and lifelong opposition to racial discrimination. But without George White or someone like him to spur him, and there was no one else quite like George White at the time, McKinley might have done less. White, of course, was the only black congressman between 1897 and 1901 the only black American who could use elective office, political office for a worthy cause at the national level. But more than that, he shared McKinley's wavelength. One caution, you'll find that neither man was perfect, neither accomplished all the goals he might have in a perfect world. McKinley was no activist, he did not take the public lead on important issues affecting African Americans, like many of his strongest supporters wished. He was a very private man, preferred to set a tone, encourage others to follow up. He did listen closely to George White and his other black advisors and acted when he felt he could. But remember, he was swimming against the tide of American public opinion, particularly in the South. The American public showed weariness with seemingly intractable problems of race. One reason why he got so little credit, I think, is because expectations on 
the one side were so high, on the other side, apathy and hostility were all pervasive. Yet, even as lynchings persisted, as black men lost the right to vote in state after Southern state in the 1890s, McKinley remained optimistic, continuing to believe that things would improve. His detractors say, okay, great, but where's the meat? I say, you're just not looking closely enough. Now, George White was not the perfect partner. He was a loner by nature. He preferred to work out, uh, work on his house bills without collaborator, collaborators. He was a skillful politician in many ways, but he was inexperienced in the ways of national compromise. He was a purist, a highly regarded orator, an intelligent, thoughtful spokesman for his race. This freshman had few immediate or natural allies, but he quickly developed a good relationship with Northern colleagues who saw a talented prospect and a rising star in the National Party. If you don't know much about White, here's a brief sketch. Born in Bladen County, before the war, raised by free parents of color in Columbus County, educated at Lumberton's Whitton School and at Howard University, became a school teacher and principal in Newburn, self-taught lawyer, joined the NC Bar in 1879, served in both houses of the General Assembly, elected district solicitor twice before winning his seat in Congress in 1896. From Tarboro, he left the house in 1901, moved to Philadelphia in 1906, spent his last 12 years as a lawyer, banker, land developer. And it was here that he became a ground level race leader. He was an honest, hardworking fighter, but he had a thin skin. He easily took offense when Southern Democrats, as they were wont to, launched personal attacks on his race or directly on him. He often responded rashly, never mincing words. Now, Judge Butterfield can tell you what worked in courtrooms, demanding equal treatment in an all white setting, showing superior skills and enviable legal knowledge is a little less effective on the national stage. However, all it earned him was a big target on his back. Equally skillful lawyers used parliamentary rules to squelch his high-minded initiatives. He believed rather naively that persuasive arguments were all it took to galvanize support, but he was wrong. Many of his colleagues sympathized and agreed with his anti-lynching bill that he introduced in 1900 on its merits by seeking co-sponsors beforehand, letting them help push the bill, he might actually have saved that signature effort. Instead, it died in the Judiciary Committee. He did get significant early help from white Republicans outside Congress, the U.S. Attorney General and ex-Attorney General of Massachusetts, both helped him, but he depended too heavily on moral indignation against lynching and issue the president twice publicly vigorously condemned as a national abomination, but no assistance. Remember, the president worked behind the scenes, did not direct them. McKinley was a skillful politician among the most accomplished of his era. Given unique talents and his personality and the war that defined him, that he worked as closely as he did with George White and other race leaders, his other appointees and the leaders of the National Afro-American Council, clearly showed that McKinley was not afraid of listening to voices outside a narrow box of insiders. No president before him had ever appointed nearly 100 black military officers in one day in command position, he was acting on advice that others might shake their heads at. If he didn't go as far as some of his advisors wanted, it was part of a singularly cautious approach to governing, forging a consensus, pleading, cajoling, inspiring by example, not using cruder 
tactics of intimidation or log rolling that were so useful to others. He was a politician, yes, but inherently decent, thoughtful, human, a rare leader in an era when marked too often by corruption and self-interest, not high moral initiatives. A century after he was murdered, few people remember how enormously popular McKinley was at the time. He was arguably the most popular president ever elected before 1900, after James Monroe. Robert Mary calls him the architect of the American century. Kevin Phillips calls him thoroughly modern McKinley, but he's forever lost in the shadow of the younger, more charismatic and unpredictable Eddie Roosevelt. As a former college instructor, I'm gonna stop here and give you a virtual pop quiz. No grade, just raise your hand. What's the first thing you remember about our 25th president? Now, if you answered six-term congressman and governor of Ohio, go to the head of the class. If you said almost elected House Speaker failed by one vote or gerrymandered out of his safe district by Democratic legislatures, you get the honor of teaching my next course. He was born in Ohio, January 1843. His birthday, January 29th, is actually the day of uh, George White's farewell speech. That is eight score and 18 years ago. He was the child of abolitionist parents, adopted the cause readily, went to college, dropped out, fought in the Civil War, went to law school, lawyer, congressman, commander in chief. Now, if you've ever handled a $500 bill, you will see McKinley's portrait on that currency, first produced in 1928, thousands printed during the Great Depression. More folks might know him if he'd stayed on the $10 bill where he started in 1902. I'm going to try to uh, sharing the screen to show some slides at this point, so bear with me. I hope that they will turn up. I probably can't find them. I need my granddaughter to help me do this. Okay. Well, maybe later. He drew large, adoring crowds wherever he appeared. He had, unfortunately, an old-looking face. He was much younger than he looked. He was followed in office by the youngest president we ever had, still to this day, larger than life, the most charismatic ever. Teddy Roosevelt was an overgrown, irresistible kid who instantly overshadowed McKinley. One of four faces on Mount Rushmore, right up there with Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, is T.R., not McKinley. Uh, FYI, McKinley did have his own mountain, the highest in North America, named for him in 1896, just after he was nominated for president by a gold prospector now called Mount Denali. But getting back to Forgotten Legacy, why write a book about McKinley and White and not two men better known? Good question. An accident, maybe. Historians are quirky. I like unexplored topics, obscure figures with hidden depth. The long answer, I've always been an American history student. Our presidents intrigue me from the truly great ones to those you can barely remember. William Henry Harrison, Miller, Millard Fillmore, Zachary Taylor, who? Today's campaigns are highly personal, loud, nonstop. 120 years ago, McKinley's reelection was not a typical campaign for him. No speeches or campaign appearances. His vice presidential nominee, T.R., the energetic war hero, did the heavy lifting. So how did he win? Only when I began researching books on George White did I look seriously at the president White served under and why he succeeded. Two very good biographies have come out about him since my 2001 book, 
but the more I dug, the more puzzled I was at a disconnect between my research and those biographies. It worried me. No one else seemed to notice just how devoted the major, as he was called, was to African-American issues. If they did, they said it was just politics. Deeper I dug, the more that sounded like a shallow generalization. In 1896, William McKinley had a secret weapon, popular endorsements by a small but significant democratic demographic, black voters. He carried no Southern states, but came very close in North Carolina, had strong finishes in Virginia, Georgia, Texas, where black men could still vote with few obstacles. He carried border states narrowly, Ohio, Kentucky, Maryland, West Virginia, all with few restrictions where even a small block of black folks could have provided that narrow margin or at least reinforcement. There are no exact numbers for black voters from the 1890s. I estimate 750,000 to 1 million black votes were theoretically available. Almost all of them, up to 90% of black men who registered were faithful Republicans at least in the South and Ohio, but there was a catch. Three quarters of all US black citizens lived in old Confederacy states in the South and Southwest where disenfranchisement was underway. Okay, for context, let me read you a short newspaper article from a week after McKinley's inauguration. The writer was a black Washington, D.C. lawyer and newspaper editor one W. Calvin Chase. On last Saturday noon, the members of the Afro-American Press Association of the United States met at the offices of the Washington Bee. Editor Chase informed the members that he had arranged with the president to meet the members of the association between the hours of 4 and 5 p.m. At 20 minutes to 5 o'clock, the association headed by Editor Chase and President W.H. Stewart arrived at the executive mansion. The editors repaired to Secretary Porter's private office where Editor Stewart delivered the following address. The country has shown its confidence in you personally as well as in the principles you represent. And now look forward with the brightest anticipations for a revival of business and a return of good and prosperous times. This is not a formal meeting of our association, but in their names, I thank you most heartily for the honor done us. And again, wish you a long and happy life and a successful administration. With Chase and Stewart that day were two dozen well-known black journalists and professional men who heard McKinley's reply, thanking them for their visit, quote, and assuring them that he has always held them in high esteem, unquote. Imagine any other U.S. president, at least until Barack Obama, giving up so much time his first weekend in office, still unpacking at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue to meet a group of black journalists he did not know. Unlike many white Republicans who paid lip service to racial integration in the party, McKinley actually felt comfortable spending time with African-Americans. His colleagues thought black folks at election time, but afterwards mostly rarely cultivated them as equals. The most social interaction outside the strictly defined rules of political gatherings was a problem. No such problem for McKinley, unlike any president before and almost all after until Franklin Roosevelt, Clinton, Obama. He had no reservation. He saw himself as president of all the people and anyone of any race who entered his office received the same unfailing courtesy and warmth in Congress, between 1876 and 1891, 
he had served alongside eight black congressmen, eight of the 18 House members elected since Reconstruction. And with the only full term US black Senator Blanche Bruce. Those still alive in 1897 were recognized and appointed. He knew them when he needed talent. Bruce, John Roy Lynch, Henry Cheatham, Robert Smalls. During his first term, McKinley carefully cultivated their support, making an astounding number of mid and high level appointments of black men, including several he met in 1897 that Saturday. And by consulting them, when considering issues of interest to black Americans. Amazing, right? He was actually listening to the people he was trying to help. He appointed black women, no fewer than 14 black female postmasters. That was the highest office available to non-voting women at the time. And he tacitly encouraged employment of them as clerks by his administration. Okay, I don't mean to overstate the to my knowledge, he never publicly advocated social equality between the races. Very few politicians did. And in that day's political environment, it bordered on political suicide to breach Jim Crow rules. Segregation was being calcified, it was set in stone. And however distasteful to McKinley, he knew what lines he could not cross, but he remained a man of solid principle and believed fervently in political equality, political equality. In the Civil War, he fought as a true believer in the abolition of slavery and endorsed the famous failed Federal Elections Bill of 1890, which barely passed the Republican House, failed in the Senate. He refused to patronize hotels that barred black patrons. As Ohio governor, he sought counsel from the few black legislators in Ohio's General Assembly. In 1894, he stopped a notorious mob aimed at lynching a convicted rapist by sending out the Ohio National Guard. In 1896, he won the Republican nomination with enthusiastic endorsements by nearly every black delegate, and there were about 100 of them to that convention. With their help, he was convincingly elected, re-elected in 1900, the first sitting president to win re-election since Ulysses Grant in 1872. Other biographers generally approved of his presidential actions during his first term, though not on race. Here he was just a prisoner of the status quo, some said, but other signals biographers failed to pick up on, in my opinion, could and should have alerted them. Okay, time for another pop quiz. Name William McKinley's first vice president. I dare you. Garrett Augustus Hobart, Gus, was a wealthy, little-known former New Jersey state senator, and the two men took to each other quickly. Gus and Jenny Hobart rented the Little Cream White House, as it's called, on Lafayette Square, still stands, just not a house and became close friends with the McKinleys who often crossed Pennsylvania Avenue for afternoon visits. Gus Hobart was also a very good manager and administrator, the first vice president ever to take an active part in helping run the government, both as Senate president, which he ran like a well-oiled machine, and as a sounding board for the famously private McKinley. Hobart was the assistant president, quote unquote, the first time that term was ever used and the last time for a century any vice president was a real partner until Mondale for Carter in the 1970s, Gore for Clinton. But early on, Hobart took his duties a step further. When McKinley's first attorney general, ex-federal judge Joseph McKenna, stepped down in early 1898, headed for the Supreme Court. Hobart recommended his New Jersey protege, Governor John W. Griggs, to replace him. And fate, at this point, put the right man exactly where he was needed 
when he was naked. He was an activist for the conscience. In early February 1898, the same week, by the way, the USS Maine blew up in Havana Harbor, a black US postmaster and his daughter were shot and burned to death by masked white men in Lake City, South Carolina. With Hobart's private advice and at McKinley's quiet urging, Griggs stepped in as an advocate for prosecuting 13 alleged lynch mob members. More on that later. George White, to his credit, quickly asked Congress to award Fraser Baker's widow a small sum, $1,000. Sensible, appropriate, you would think, but there was pushback. If White had withdrawn his bill, Congressman from Illinois, the home of anti-lynching crusader Ida B. Wells Barnett, were waiting in the wings to introduce a similar bill which might well have passed. White said no. He was adamant. In the end, the widow Baker got nothing. The investigation of her husband's murder was supervised by Griggs and it led to a well-publicized trial in Charleston a year later. Among the most vigorous prosecutions ever mounted against accused lynchers, that trial supervised by Griggs from DC was for conspiracy. Murder was only a federal crime on military reservations and Indian reservations at that time. And there was no death penalty involved. Yet the trial was dramatic. Two defendants turned state's evidence. Other brave witnesses of both races testified against fellow townsmen. Some recruited for the lynch mob. Mrs. Baker was shot. She survived. She escaped with five children. And she testified to the grisly circumstances, but she could not identify anyone behind those masks. In the end, the case fell apart with a hung jury. Most jurors reportedly favored guilty verdicts for seven defendants, and there was one report of an 11 to 1 ballot against the lead defendant. An astonishing outcome in the Deep South. Griggs and the prosecutors wanted a retrial where a conviction might still have resulted, but witnesses and defendants quickly began disappearing, zeal dwindled, and no retrial ever happened. So a very disappointed John Griggs turned to advising George White on introducing an anti-lynching bill in the next US Congress, which opened seven months later. Lynchings were still painfully common, perhaps 150 a year, mostly in the South, mostly with black victims. The bill was conceived by White, its language tweaked by Griggs and former Massachusetts Attorney General Albert Pillsbury, who later became one of the white founders of the biracial NAACP. White's final bill added federal death penalty for taking part in a lynching bee in one early draft. It also established a precursor of the FBI to investigate lynchings, although that language was brought to broaden support in an uncertain time. Okay, one more pop quiz. What state level did both President McKinley and Congressman White hold? Tough one? Both men had once been elected prosecutors, McKinley's first elected office. As a district prosecutor, the only black US elected solicitor for eight years, White had no trouble with the death penalty personally. In theory, opposed after a fair trial, imposed after a fair trial, but he adamantly opposed vigilante justice. Baker's murder affected him deeply fellow school teacher, just a few years younger, lived 100 miles from where he grew up. But the most direct result of Baker's murder was the first truly nationwide civil rights organization, the National Afro-American Council, or the NAC as I call it, 
founded by A.M.E. Zion Bishop Alexander Walters and journalist P. Thomas Fortune. White and more than 150 Amer African American leaders signed Walters' national call, citing Baker's murder and other racial violence and lynchings. It was formally established at Rochester, New York in September 1898. The neck lasted until 1908. Few people know much about it today. Most think the NAACP, open to whites and blacks, was the first, but it was the NAC where most black NAACP members cut their organizational teeth. The council was important for one more big reason. Its leaders, including George White, regularly consulted with McKinley at the White House, bringing him their annual addresses to the nation directly, seeking assistance on major civil rights issues, lynching, Southern disenfranchisement, convict leasing, other discrimination. The relationship was hardly perfect. The council was officially nonpartisan, most of its members were Republicans, but many Black independents and Democrats joined, so it fragmented along philosophical fault lines. Some council members, most notably independent Thomas P. Thomas Fortune, openly criticized McKinley for not acting more forcefully in resolving their issues and for trying to conciliate Southern Democrats, who were the obvious villains in America's ongoing race battle. But never again did the White House serve as a regular gathering place for such an impressive group of black leadership. The cream of the crop, lawyers, clergymen, professors, journalists. No president after McKinley ever provided such personal encouragement on specific issues. A simmering congressional issue outside the anti-lynching bill, which we'll talk about in just a second, was a plan by Republican House members to reduce representation of Southern states in Congress when reapportionment based on the 1900 census was discussed. McKinley simply opposed it. He was convinced that such a move was dangerous, unfair, and politically wrong. A lily white Republican movement staring at a future with handfuls of black voters, not the much larger numbers that had once enjoyed it, infuriated George White and other faithful black Republicans across the South and beyond. George White introduced the anti lynching bill. It was the council's top priority and seems to have had McKinley's personal backing, but something tragic happened at this point. In late 1899, Vice President Hobart died. And no one else could have guided the bill through the Senate, including avoiding a filibuster by Southern Democrats. George White must have realized that at Hobart's funeral in New Jersey, which he attended along with McKinley, his cabinet, most of the Supreme Court, and most Congress. Yet he did not give up. With Briggs' help, he introduced the bill in the House in January a month after McKinley's annual message to Congress, restated his personal opposition to lynching. White's tactical error, not recruiting House co-sponsors. Of course, there were other obstacles. There was no Republican consensus on the bill before introduction. 1900 was a re-election year. McKinley hoped to carry even one Southern state, but would carry none. It wouldn't be helped by this if he endorsed the bill. George White was also a marked man in North Carolina. He was locked in a nasty public battle with Josephus Daniel, the publisher of the News and Observer who opposed lynching but hated White. Voters were soon to decide on that constitutional amendment aimed at barring Black Republicans from the polls. The point to me here is that the political situation was complicated. McKinley fairly got out, rarely got out in front of his party on issues. But he did take the lead on jobs. 
He radically increased black American employment at all levels by the federal government during his years in office. In late 1897, a Washington Evening Star article listed black federal employees at nearly 3,000, including more than 100 black postmasters, most in the South, but two in Ohio. If that's accurate, he appointed more black office holders than all his predecessors combined. Harrison, the previous record, hired about 2,000. Notable as they were, black postmasters were simply the most visible presidential appointees. He appointed at state level, U.S. Treasury Department, U.S. Customs Service, and Internal Revenue Service black officials. Just how many he did appoint, McKinley, is not clear. They're, they did not keep records by race at the time, but he encouraged many more appointments by allowing racial tolerance to take place, to take root at mid and lower levels. One last pop twist, I promise. What president spoke at four historically black colleges, four different historically black colleges? Bonus points for any school and its leader. Okay, if you're screaming with your hands, whoever said McKinley, Tuskegee Institute, and Booker T. Washington wins. December 1898, during his Peace Jubilee Tour of the South. That same year, McKinley also spoke at what is now Savannah State University. And in 1901, on his very last Southern tour, he spoke at two other HBCUs, the now defunct original Southern University in New Orleans and the teacher training school now called Prairie View A&M University near Houston, Texas. At every stop, he encouraged African-American students to make the most of their education, to learn a trade, a profession, and to keep participating in U.S. economic life as productive citizens. For example, his 1899 speech to 3,000 black Sunday worshipers in Chicago's Quinn Chapel AME Church. No other leader ever took such pains to reach out to black citizens on their own ground. I do have a closing thought on history in general. You know, history is written by the winners hardly ever by the vanquished. So it was certainly that way when I grew up. The 1975 press release I told you about the first museum exhibit honoring black 19th century congressmen came three quarters of a century after he left Congress. A newspaper reporter in me wanted more facts, not fewer. Started me thinking about the accuracy of what I'd always heard, what I'd always been taught. All those missing facts covered up by loud and less accurate opinions. That led to my biography of White. His story deserved to be told far more completely. He was not the troublemaking militant that Josephus Daniels and white supremacists saw, but he was a principled statesman who tried and failed, but found other ways to save his race from oppression not as a lawyer, banker, or as a lawyer, banker, land developer, not as a congressman. I still have a journalist mentality. A good friend and fellow print reporter told me once we're forever journalists wherever we end up. So studying old newspapers remains an intrinsic part of my worldview. I'm hopelessly old fashioned about journalism. I don't want to be in the story. Just taboo. So my opinion rarely shows up in my books, I hope. One reason why I never went back to journalism after I left, today's agenda-driven reporting mostly by sincere broadcast journalists, not by fading newspapers, glorifies stream of consciousness accounts, but they're alien to me. I recognize the sincere motives of most journalists. I just can't go there. I still prefer to give out all the facts. Neutrally, let readers draw their own conclusions. Seven years of newspaper research led to 
this book, Forgotten Legacy. Fleshing out the story of one more overlooked man by interweaving it with the life of his strongest black ally. So if Forgotten Legacy has done anything worthwhile, I hope it will kickstart a new conversation about these two men. Always something new to learn if you know where to dig. The Washington Evening Star for me was a great source. It's been my pleasure to join you today. Feel free to write to me with questions. Folks at Carborough Town Hall have my email address and I promise to answer quickly. Now, back to you, James. Dr. J uh, Justison, thank you so much for that informative uh, talk. I do have a couple of questions. I think we have a, a few minutes. Uh, you know, I think you mentioned that um, George H. White was the only black uh, congressman in the United States um, for a period, I don't know whether it was for, 18, four for, for four years. And one of those years would have been 1898, is that correct? That is correct. And in 1898, um, the Wilmington massacre and coup d'etat took place mm -hmm. in, in George White's own home state of North Carolina. Yes, it did. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, I'm trying to envision what conversations he and McKinley may have had related to that, um, that massacre, that unfolding horror that was taking place in North Carolina, in a sense, under McKinley's watch, so to speak. I mean, I understand he's the president of the United States. I mean, he, but still. I would imagine there was an effort by George White to get some involvement of the United States in trying to address that effort. Can you shed any light on that? Uh, yes, I can. I, I could probably talk all night about it, but I, I refuse to. Um, it's <laughs> it's covered in the book. Yeah, I, I, I would say. I covered a little better than I can tell you now, but basically what happened was that when the Wilmington riots took place, everybody turned to the president. He was talked about it at his cabinet meeting and he was just absolutely flabbergasted that it was going on. They said, send in the troops. You got the right to do it under a very obscure law that's become more famous quite recently from the Ku Klux Klan era. And he said, well, before we send in the troops, one thing's gotta happen. The governor of the state's gotta ask for it. He's got to say he can't keep the peace in his own state. And then we'll talk about sending in the troops. And basically that's what happened. The governor never asked for federal help. And McKinley knew that Sending in troops without anybody asking for it would probably make the situation even worse than it was. The other thing was that the violence, as bad as it was, and it was pretty awful, it died out very quickly. It was all over within three or four days. Now, George White was not in forget exactly where he was when this took place. I think he went back to Washington. He did not talk to the president immediately. Congress was not in session. The, the election had just been held. He'd just been reelected. George White went on a speaking tour in Boston and, and uh, Canada about this thing that's going on. And he wrote the president and asked him later if he would actually stop in North Carolina on his way to Atlanta, which is where he was going in December. And it was kind of a complicated situation. The president, because he rushed back from his speaking tour and said, will you go? And the president left town the day that George White wrote the letter. And we're not sure the president ever saw the letter. He didn't. 
stop, didn't speak in North Carolina at any rate. It would have seemed to be a perfect moment, but there would have been nothing George White could have told him any more informative than what he was being told by his people on the ground in North Carolina. The situation is horrible. Your options are limited. What can we do? Anyway, that, that's, a, that's a quick and dirty look at what, right. what happened. Right. One other, one question from the audience relates to, I think your assertion, and I may not get this quite right, that you didn't feel that, well, that you thought that if George White had gotten a Republican co-sponsor, I don't know whether any specific individuals for his anti-lynching bill, it probably mm -hmm. would have passed. Are you, what do you base that on given the, you know, the, the, the racist sentiment across, certainly across the South and, you know, in a lot of other places in the country period. Uh, and, and also given the fact that, you know, for many years after there's no anti-lynching bill that was able to pass. So what, what, what about that moment makes you think that it, it could have very well happened? had he gotten Republican co-sponsor? Well, I didn't say it would have passed. I said it might have been voted on. Okay. It never even got voted on. Okay. Well, I hope that's what I said. But the problem was that he would have had to have someone working on his behalf who was on the House Judiciary Committee to make sure that it was called up for a vote in the committee and reported to the House floor. Okay. And that did not happen. Now, because George White believed that the, the bill should be introduced on its own, own and it should be voted on freestanding, I think he missed his, his window closed far too quickly. Too quickly. It, you, you remember I, I talked about what he did for the Frazier Baker compensation bill that he, um, he was begged, pleaded with by Ida Wells Barnett, who said, Mr. White, withdraw your bill. My men can pass theirs. You'll never get yours passed. And he would not do it. He simply, because he, he wanted his name on that bill. And he didn't ask anybody to go in on it with him either. Uh -huh. It was it was tough. But there were enough people, Republicans had a majority in the House. Had it been put up for a vote on the floor, it might have passed. I don't know about the Senate. I know it would have passed or come close to passing in the House. So, okay. can, can you give us a thumbnail sketch of what after George White left North Carolina, uh -huh. just you know, some 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 aspects of what he was able to accomplish, uh, you know, once he left North Carolina, uh, or did he stay in North Carolina for a while before leaving? To he never he never came back. Okay. He, uh, his family was in Washington. His wife was uh, an invalid, and she could only get the kind of care she needed in Washington. When she died in 1905, he moved to Philadelphia, and that's where he lived the rest of his life. He started the first Black-owned bank, commercial savings bank, in Philadelphia. He founded a savings and loan association tied to that, and he developed this little town in um, New Jersey called Whitesboro. It was designed as a model utopian community for Blacks from the South. It's uh, just above, just above uh, Cape May City. He also, he worked on the, um, the U.S. Constitution League during the Brownsville, uh, the dismissal of all the Brownsville soldiers by President Roosevelt. He was a founding member of the Philadelphia chapter of the NAACP. And he worked for the rest of his life after he left Washington both to make money for himself and to help people. 
he literally was an educator. He worked in nonprofits. He did everything that he thought he could do and more. He never got rich. He might have, but he, he never did. I think that he's truly one of the unsung heroes of the early 20th century. Right. Because he was in Philadelphia where nobody knew him, so to speak. He was uh, overlooked. So I've got one, um, I think, final question. He, sure. we haven't talked a lot about the circumstances of his, his birth. Uh, I can, we can assume that his parents were probably of modest means. Um, how did he eventually sort of manage to end up, I think we mentioned undergrad school at Howard University, mm -hmm. um, and then becoming a lawyer? Can you share quick thoughts on that? Uh, sure. His father was uh, of mixed race. His, his stepmother was of mixed race. I know nothing about his mother. We've never been able to find out who his natural mother was. But those two got married when George was uh, four years old. And they raised him. They were both free. They'd been free before the war. They were very hardworking um turpentine farmers, if you will. They had large expenses in the swamp and Bladen in Columbus County of uh, pine trees. And they drained the turpentine, the sap from the pine trees, made turpentine from it and made a living. His father was actually a uh, cast maker. He owned a business on a sawmill where he actually made the cast to hold the turpentine to put on the barges and send down to Wilmington where it was sold. They were not rich by any means, but they were not poverty stricken either. They were, they were in a very a closed environment of, of free blacks, free people of color who were mixed Indians and blacks and white who lived in the swamps in that area. And the re where he got the money from, his father, uh, went to Washington to take a job and said, George, if you will run the farm and the sawmill for me for a year, you can keep every dollar you make from it. And that's how he paid for his first year's tuition at Howard. So they, they were thrifty. They saved their money. He worked his butt off and he you know, made a name for himself. He was probably one of the brightest students that ever came out of that town. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate your sharing um, some of your vast knowledge of not just um, George H. White, but also that connection between he and um, and William, uh, President um, McKinley. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'll also mention that I, I first, and I don't know whether you recall. And, and I guess it's the only time we've met because we were hoping to be able to do it in person. But the, the, the first time I met you was actually two years ago at the African American um, cultural event in, yep. in Raleigh when you were doing a presentation on George White um, mm -hmm. for that event. And uh, also I think present were um, uh, Mr. Vincent Spaulding, who's yes a relative or a descendant of, and, and Mr. Spaulding is involved in others in preserving the legacy of George H. White. And mm -hmm. um, I think there's a website that has information related to um, George White, but also involving the, the home place, I think that they're trying to preserve. Yes, uh, yes. Can you just take a moment to say something about that? It is a, uh... All the information is at www.georgehenrywhite.com. Okay. And the Spalding connection, that was George White's stepmother was a Spalding. Mm -hmm. and the Spalding Foundation has been the one that Fenton is uh, affiliated with and that's underwriting this wonderful George Henry White Memorial Center in Bladen County is becoming a 
community health, education, and uh, a recreational center for a very underserved part of the state. The state. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate um, sure. your presentation. Take care. My pleasure. Anytime. Okay. So um, our next, um, well, next I will introduce to you um, one of my favorite people, Benita Mason Hogans um, is a native of Chapel Hill. Uh, she and you know, her, she's from, I believe seven generations of, uh, as she described them, moving, movement people on both sides of her family from this area. She uh, serves as program manager at Duke University Center for Documentary Studies for the Critical Oral Histories component. She's worked with a number of civil rights veterans and uh, today's activists to document movement history. Uh, there are a number of other things that I could, uh, to, could say about her and her work. Uh, she describes the critical oral history methodology in a TED talk that she has done. And most um, importantly, and I shouldn't leave this out, her current advocation is for a no cost education program and cost free college tuition for descendants of the enslaved laborers at UNC. And um, Danita is going to introduce um, our students who are going to be uh, involved in, in rendering George H. White's speech and also providing some context for that speech. So I turn it over to Mrs. Danita Mason Hogans. You're on mute, Ms. Mason Hogans. You're on mute. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, so <laughs> let me start over. <laughs> I wanted to thank you so much, Mr. Williams. I actually was just going on and on and on about thanking you for coming up with the concept for this program. And um, I'd also like to Give thanks to Director Wellman at North Carolina A&T and Director Garrett at NCCU. Of course, I'd like to thank Karina Riley and Charles Harrison from the town of Carborough for their help. And of course, our wonderful pa panelists. So I'd like to briefly share a bit about the Cheatham White Scholars. They're selected for this four year full ride academic scholarship, which is akin to the Moorhead Scholarship at UNC. Um, because of their scholarship, most have a grade point average of above a 4.5 and SAT and ACT scores in the top 3% of the country. The photo that I'm sharing with you is an example of their commitment to service when they arrived to Chapel Hill in 2019 to provide ACT, SAT and study skill assistance to local students. I'm also very proud to be the mother of two Cheatham White Scholars <laughs> at North Carolina a &T. So our three scholars are fine examples of youth leadership and I'd like to introduce them to you. First, we have Anaya Harrison, who is a junior political science student from Madison, North Carolina. Anaya is the, in the inaugural cohort of the NCCU Cheatham White Scholars and she served as sophomore class secretary for the SGA, is a member of the Student Judicial Board and president of Democracy Matters. Currently, Anaya serves as a political action and care civic engagement co-chair, where she's been working diligently on the issue of voting rights. Malcolm Hawkins is a junior electrical engineering student with experience in aviation, oil and gas, and HVAC industries. He served 
as Vice President of the National Society of Black Engineers, NSVE. Malcolm curates interactive programming for engineering students in a virtual environment and believes that success is rooted in passion for any endeavor. He serves in the Aggie Ambassador Program, the Engineers Toastmasters, and is a mentor with orienting minority students in the field of engineering. Milos McAdoo, Orange County's very own, is a sophomore animal science major at North Carolina A&T State University who hopes one day to work in the animal agricultural industry. Milos hopes to develop strategies to combat food insecurity by researching animal genetics and reproductive physiology. He has served as a state officer for the North Carolina FFA Association, and he's worked with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and is passionate about livestock care and agricultural ag advocacy. So I believe that not only should we allow space for young people while we are charting our course for the future, but we should listen to them. And not only should we listen, but we should allow them to lead. Young people, including George White, when he was a young man, beginning his political career, have the vision and clarity to, lead to, clarity to lead us into a new era. And if we were to listen to young people, we would have worked harder to understand systemic racism in the police department, voter suppression, the devaluation of black lives when Trayvon Martin was killed in 2012. So I'm going to, I'm going to allow the young people to speak for themselves now. They have presented, they have prepared a, a wonderful presentation for you and following their presentation, we will have a response from them and take questions for you. Thank you again, Mr. Williams. Good evening. I'll be giving the farewell address spoken by George H. White on January 29th, 1901 in Washington, DC. I want to enter a plea for the colored man, the colored woman, the colored boy, and the colored girl of this country. I would not thus digress from the question at issue and detain the house in a discussion of the interests of this particular people at this time, but for the constant and the persistent efforts of certain gentlemen upon this floor to mold and rivet public sentiment against us as a people and to lose no opportunity to hold up the unfortunate few who commit crimes and depredations and lead lives of infamy and shame as other races do as fair specimens of representatives of the entire colored race. In the catalog of members of Congress in this house, perhaps none have been more persistent in their determination to bring the black man into disrepute and with the labored effort to show that he was unworthy of the right of citizenship than my colleague from North Carolina, Mr. Kitchen. During the first session of his Congress, while the constitutional amendment was pending in North Carolina, he labored long and hard to show that the white race was at all times and under all circumstances superior to the Negro by inheritance, if not otherwise, and the excuse for his party supporting that amendment which has since been adopted was that an illiterate Negro was unfit to participate in making the laws of a sovereign state and the administration and execution of them. But an illiterate white man living by his side with no more or perhaps not as much property, with no more exalted character, no higher thoughts of civilization, no more knowledge of the handicraft of government had by birth because he was white inherited some peculiar qualification. In the town where this young gentleman was born, at the general election last August for the adoption of the constitutional amendment and the general election for state and county officers, Scotland Neck had a registered white vote of 395, most of whom, of course, were Democrats, and a registered colored vote of 534, virtually, if not all of whom were Republicans, and so voted. When the count was announced, however, there were 831 Democrats to 75 Republicans. But in the town of Halifax, same county, the result was much more pronounced. In that town, the registered Republican vote was 345, and the total registered vote of the township was 539. But when the count was announced, it stood 990 Democrats to 41 Republicans, or 492 more Democratic votes counted than were registered votes in the township. Comment here is unnecessary, nor do I think it necessary for anyone to wonder 
at the peculiar notion my colleague has with reference to the manner of voting and the method of counting these votes. Nor is it to be a wonder that he is a member of this Congress, having been brought up and educated in such wonderful notions of dealing out fair-handed justice to his fellow man. It would be unfair, however, for me to leave the inference upon the minds of those who hear me that all of the white people of the state of North Carolina hold views with Mr. Kitchen and think as he does. Thank God there are many noble exceptions to the example he sets that too, in the Democratic Party, men who have never been afraid that one uneducated, poor, depressed Negro could put to flight and chase into degradation two educated, wealthy, thrifty white men. There has been, there never has been, nor ever will be, any Negro domination in that state, and no one knows it any better than the Democratic Party. It is convenient howl, however, often resorted to in order to consummate a diabolical purpose by scaring the weak and gullible whites into support of measures and men suitable to the demagogue and the ambitious office seeker whose crave for office overshadows and puts to flight all other considerations fair or unfair. I wish to quote from another Southern gentleman, not so young as my other friends, and who always commands attention in this house by his wit and humor, even though his speeches may not be edifying and instructive. I refer to Mr. Odie of Virginia and quote from him, from him in a recent speech on this floor as follows. Justice is merely relative. It can exist between equals. It can exist among homogeneous people. It can exist among lions but between lions and lambs, never. If justice were absolute, lions must of necessity perish. Open his ponderous jaws and find the strong teeth which God has made expressly to chew lamb's flesh. When the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals shall overcome this difficulty, men may hope to settle the race question among along sentimental lines, not sooner. I am wholly at sea as to just what Mr. Odie had in view in advancing the thoughts contained in the above quotation, unless he wishes to extend the simile and apply the lion as a white man and the Negro as a lamb. In that case, we will gladly accept the comparison for of all animals known in God's creation, the lamb is the most inoffensive and has been in all ages held up as a badge of innocence. But what will my good friend of Virginia do with the Bible? For God says that he created all men of one flesh and blood. I regard his borrowed thoughts as very inaptly applied. However, I fear I'm giving too much time in the consideration of these personal comments of members of Congress, but I trust I will be pardoned for making a passing reference to one more gentleman, Mr. Wilson of South Carolina, who in the early part of this month made a speech, some parts of which did great credit to him, showing, as it did, capacity for collating, arranging, and advancing thoughts of others and of making a pretty strong argument out of a very poor case. If he had stopped there while not agreeing with him, many of us would have been forced to admit that he had done well, but his purpose was incomplete until he dragged in the reconstruction days and held up to scorn and ridicule the few, the few ignorant, gullible, and perhaps purchasable Negroes who served in the state legislature of South Carolina over 30 years ago. Not a word did he say about the unscrupulous white men and the main bummers who followed in the wake of the federal army and settled themselves in the Southern states and preyed upon the ignorant and unskilled minds of the colored people, looted the states of their wealth, brought in the lowest disrepute, the ignorant colored people, then hide away to their Northern homes for ease and comfort, the balance of their lives, of their lives, or join the Democratic Party to obtain social recognition and have greatly aided in depressing and further degrading those whom they had used as tools to accomplish a diabolical purpose. These few ignorant men who chanced at that time to hold office are given as a reason why the black man should not be permitted to participate in the affairs of the government, which he is forced to pay taxes to support. Representative Wilson insists that they, the Southern whites, are the black man's best friend and that they're taking him by the hand and trying to lift him up, that they are educating him. For all that he and all Southern people have done in this regard, I wish in behalf of the colored people of the South to extend our thanks. We are not ungrateful to friends, but feel that our toil has made our friends able to contribute the stinty penance which we have received at their hands. 
I read in a Democratic paper a few days ago, the Washington Times, an extract which showed that the money for each white child in the state ranged from three to five times as much per capita as was given to each colored child. This is helping us some, but not to the extent that one would infer from the gentleman's speech. If the gentleman to whom I preferred will pardon me, I would like to advance the statement that the musty records of 1868 filed away in the archives of Southern capitals as to what the Negro was 32 years ago is not a proper standard by which the Negro living on the threshold of the 20th century should be measured. Since that time, we have reduced the illiteracy of the race by at least 45%. We have written and published nearly 500 books. We have nearly 800 newspapers, three of which are dailies. We now have a practice over 2,000 lawyers and a corresponding number of doctors. We have accumulated over $12 million worth of school property and about $40 million worth of church property. We have about 140,000 farms and homes valued in the neighborhood of $750 million and personal property valued about $170 million. We have raised about $11 million for educational purposes and the property per capita for every colored man, woman and child in the United States is estimated at $75. We are operating successfully several banks, commercial enterprises among our people in the Southland, including one silk mill and one cotton factory. We have 32,000 teachers in the schools of the country. We have built with the aid of our friends about 20,000 churches and support seven colleges, seven, 17 academies, 50 high schools, five law schools, five medical schools, and 25 theological seminaries. We have over 600,000 acres of land in the South alone. The cotton produced mainly by black labor has increased from 4,669,770 bales in 1860 to 11,235,000 in 1899. All this was done under the most adverse circumstances. We have done it in the face of lynching, burning at the stake, with the humiliation of Jim Crow laws, the disfranchisement of our male citizens, slander and degradation of our women, with the factories closed against us, no Negro permitted to be conductor on the railway cars, whether run through the streets of our cities or across the prairies of our great country, no Negro permitted to run as engineer on a locomotive, most in the mines closed against us. Labor unions, carpenters, painters, brick masons, machinists, hackmen, and those supplying nearly every conceivable avocation for livelihood have banded themselves together to better their condition, but with few exceptions, the black face has been left out. The Negroes are seldom employed in our mercantile stores. At this, we do not wonder. Someday we hope to have them employed in our own stores. With all these odds against us, we are forging our way ahead. Slowly perhaps, but surely. You may tie us and then taunt us for a lack of bravery, but one day we will break the bonds. You may use our labor for two and a half centuries and then taunt us for our poverty. But let me remind you, we will not always remain poor. You may withhold even the knowledge of how to read God's word and learn the way from earth to glory and then taunt us for our ignorance. But we would remind you that there's plenty of room at the top and we are climbing. After enforced debauchery with many kindred horrors incident to slavery, it comes with ill grace from the perpetrators of these deeds to hold up the shortcomings of some of our race to ridicule and scorn. Mr. Chairman, permit, to, permit me to digress for a few moments for the purpose of calling the attention of the House to a bill which I regard as important, introduced by me in the early part of the first session of this Congress. It was intended to give the United States control and entire jurisdiction over all cases of lynching and death by mob violence. During the last session of this Congress, I took occasion to address myself in detail to this particular measure, but with all my efforts, the bill still sweetly sleeps in the room of the committee to which it was referred. The necessity of legislation along this line is daily being demonstrated. The arena of the lyncher no longer is confined to Southern climes, but is stretching its hydra head over all parts of the union. Sow the seed of a tarnished name, you sow the seed of eternal shame. It is needless to ask what the harvest will be. You may dodge this question now. You may defer it to a more seasonable day. You may, as the gentleman from Maine, Littlefield puts it, waddle in and waddle out until the mind was left in doubt, whether the snake that made the track was going south or coming back. This evil peculiar to America yes, to the United States, must be met somehow, someday. 
Mr. Chairman, before concluding my remarks, I want to submit a brief recipe for the solution of the so-called American Negro problem. He asks no special favors, but simply demands that he be given the same chance for existence, for earning a livelihood, for raising himself in the scales of manhood and womanhood that are accorded to kindred nationalities. Treat him as a man, go into his home and learn of his social conditions, learn of his cares, his troubles, and his hopes for the future. Gain his confidence. Open the doors of industry to him. Let the word Negro, colored, and black be stricken from all the organizations enumerated in the Federation of Labor. Help him to overcome his weaknesses, punish the crime committing class by the courts of the land, measure the standard of the race by its best material, cease to mold prejudicial and unjust public sentiment against him. And my word for it, he will learn to support, hold up the hands of, and join in with that political party, that institution, whether secular or religious, in every community where he lives, which is destined to do the greatest good for the greatest number. Obliterate race hatred, party prejudice, and help us to achieve nobler ends, greater results, and become satisfactory citizens to our brother in white. This, Mr. Chairman, is perhaps the Negro's temporary farewell to the American Congress, but let me say, Phoenix-like, he will rise up someday and come again. These parting words are on behalf of an outraged, heartbroken, bruised, and bleeding, but God-fearing, faithful, industrious, loyal, people-rising people, full of potential force. Mr. Chairman, in the trial of Lord Bacon, when the court disturbed the counsel for the defendant, Sir Walter Raleigh, raised himself up to his full height and, addressing the court, said, Sir, I am pleading for the life of a human being. The only apology that I have to make for the earnestness with which I have spoken is that I am pleading for the life, the liberty, the future happiness, and manhood suffrage for one-eighth of the entire population of the United States. And that concludes this speech. That was excellent, Malcolm. Thank you so much for doing that. I would ask now Milos and Anaya if you would have a response. We can start with uh, Milos. Thank you. Once again, I'm Milos McAdoo, a sophomore animal science student at North Carolina a and State University. I'm honored to be providing a brief response uh, to uh, Congressman George H. White's farewell address. There's plenty of room at the top and we are climbing. This single line of Congressman George H. White's farewell address embodies the true meaning of determination. During an extremely tumultuous time in our nation's history, a time where hopelessness for change seemed all too familiar, Congressman White chose to hold on to the future, a future filled with opportunities for those who had been ignored for far too long, a future designed for black individuals in this country to feel heard, to feel seen, and to feel empowered. Throughout his address, Mr. White sheds light on admirable accomplishments of the black community during this era, including increased land ownership, education, and economic opportunities, to name a few. However, he doesn't do so without also a acknowledging the egregious oppression that coincided with it. Physical violence against men and women, voter fraud and suppression, and lack of accessibility to certain jobs were only a few acts put against communities of color that were mentioned in this speech. Despite this, White acknowledges that the Black community somehow still showed resilience. His mention of these acts reminds me that there is still work to be done now. While their form may have changed, violence, suppression, and lack of accessibility are still unfortunately a part of our nation's story. Senseless killing of Black people, astonishing gaps in wages, and disparities in health care have especially been recognized in this past year. Like George White, it is important to acknowledge these disparities and continue focusing on developing a better future for our successors. It would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the tremendous strides that have been made since Mr. White stood in front of his fellow congressmen 120 years ago. Acknowledging these improvements lets us know that we are capable of bridging gaps and continuing growth. Through his farewell address, Congressman White shows us that it is not only important to have a seat at the table, but to also have a voice. Mr. White used his voice to advocate for the black community. He used his voice to speak truth. He used his voice to continue bringing about the social changes necessary to progress this country. Malcolm, myself, and the remainder of the Cheatham White Scholars at North Carolina A&T plan to continue 
honoring Mr. White's legacy by ensuring that we have a seat and a voice at the table. There's plenty of room at the top and we will continue climbing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Milo. Anaya, would you like to go now, please? Thank you. Um, yes, I would like to thank you all for allowing me to be here um, tonight. And I am excited, excited to speak on behalf of my fellow NCCU Cheetah White Scholars. Um, so firstly, I would like to uh, begin by talking a little bit about his legacy. Um, in his speeches you have just heard, he says, Phoenix like he will rise up someday and come again. Um, I think Mr. White knew that despite all of his work and the strides that he made for the advancement of the African American community, as well as citizens of this nation, that it would be a while before another um, African American had that opportunity, but he knew that eventually we would be able to overcome those barriers that were placed before us and make necessary and monumental change within this country. Um, and since, you know, his um, time that he served us, we've seen great leaders emerge such as John Lewis, Maxine Waters. We even had the opportunity to sit here tonight with GK Butterfield. Um, and, you know, we've even had the opportunity to see our first African-American president in office. And now we have the privilege of having the first African-American female vice president in office who was also a graduate of Howard University um, like Mr. White. But I say all this to say that representation truly matters who you see in the position before you and that you want to be in matters. Um, and there was someone who had to take that leap of faith after Mr. White. And I'm sure that seeing and hearing Mr. White's legacy in that position gave him the confidence and the reassurance that he needed to do what he knew was possible um, and to continue to make strides for the African-American community. Um, and secondly, I would like to address um, the portion of this speech where he um, talks about the African Negro um, or the American Negro problem. Um, and his solution in a basic summary was equality, um, the opportunity to be seen as equals among this nation. He doesn't ask for any special conditions, any special treatment or reparations for what has been done in the past, but to simply be seen as an American which is a right that should have already been given to us. Um, and I think that speaks volumes to the character of George Henry White. He didn't want war and chaos for this nation, but he wanted the opportunity for every African-American to be able to build a successful life for themselves without the fear of lynching or violence against them. Um, and lastly, I have been a Cheatham White scholar for three years now. And it is an honor to be able to represent and honor the legacy of Mr. George Henry White. And during my tenure here, I've had the opportunity to an, attend an illustrious HBCU without having to worry about tuition and housing, the opportunity to travel abroad and experience diverse cultures, to serve my community to the best of my ability, and to even speak at events such as these right now. And I believe um, that all of my fellow Cheatham White scholars whether that's at a and or um, here at NCCU can agree that this is the dream that George Henry White would have wanted for all of us. So again, I thank you for allowing me to speak um, and it has been a pleasure. Thank you though. Thank you for those very excellent responses. I'd like to invite our listeners tonight, if you'd like to um, go to the Q and A section on the bottom of your screen, if you have any questions for our scholars, please feel free to ask them. We might have a few minutes to ask, um, to answer those questions. I would actually like to start out with a question for you all. And it was based on the great reading that Malcolm gave. Congressman White addressed literacy rates and he said that um, the literacy rate had increased by 45%. Now, however, only 18% 8, of black eighth graders are deemed proficient, and only 17% of Black 12th graders are. Congressman Wright almost always talked about his pride in the journalistic exploits of Black newspapers. There, he, I think, referenced that they had 800 newspapers. Now we have 100. He talked about the advantage of being able to have the church and the educational environment pair so that we could um, en enlighten our children. 
We see a declination and an assault on the black church right now. He spoke of colleges and universities. Unfortunately, many of our HBCUs are seeing a decline in uh, funding. And he also talked about black owned uh, uh, banks. Now we have less than two dozen. So my question to you young people is, what are the things that we are not listening to today that we need to listen to? In your view, what are the issues that we need to address to put us on a different path from where Congressman, when Congressman White was speaking of? Well, I can start. Well, in my opinion, I think that there has been since the end of the, the civil rights movement where there was so much change that really brought people to a place where uh, many Americans believe that, okay, now African Americans have made it, uh, have finally gotten the rights that um, we fought for for so long. And there really has been, I think, in addition to both you know, whites and blacks, there has been a kind of a feeling where maybe there hasn't been as much emphasis. Now we kind of reached that period of, oh, we can start up integrate and there's been that loss of things that are specifically, you know, that have been historically um, geared towards black people as black stories about colleges, black banks. Um, we're seeing a loss of those um, in America just because there has really been a, a heightened sense of trying to bring everyone together. Um, but I think these past 10 years have really shown that we haven't gotten to the place that we need to be at. Um, and that really brings back the point where there is still a need for Black banks, Black colleges, um, Black institutions to really show that uh, we support each other and that we're here uh, to really make sure that we make it in the future, that we continue to fight, continue to make strides, uh, continue to work with others because uh, we can't do it alone, but we continue to work with others to make this happen and make uh, Mr. White, Congressman Mike's dream of having actually achieving this racial equality, making a reality. Thank you. Yeah, I certainly agree with um, Malcolm in saying this. And I think it's so, so important for us to really just um, acknowledge the, as, as I mentioned, just acknowledge the things that are going wrong. Um, I think it's oftentimes the case that we try and um, push things aside and um, try and have, you know, unite, not, and that's so important, you know, for us to do, but um, it's it's really important for us to acknowledge what's, what's going wrong and then make real solutions to fix those issues. Um, and then also just embracing, um, you know, black people and the successes um, that we've experienced as well. I think, you know, a lot of times where um, there's a negative light shot um, that, that is shined on our community. Um, and so just making sure that we're, you know, um, having the opportunity just to display the amazing things that have been done, um, even since uh, Congressman George White spoke in front of um, his fellow congressmen over a century ago. Um, personally, um, I, have seen myself. Um, I have so many friends um, and family who are business owners um, who are African American. Um, and I just feel like as of recently and um, coming with this awareness that there is still an issue um, within America um, involving racism and um, systemic oppression, um, I think that there is a, um, I, I wouldn't say like reawakening, but more of a drive for a lot of, um, I feel like my peers and um, my family and friends just to be able to, you know, liberate themselves in that uh, way financially. Um, and I think I can't speak as to now um, necessarily what I feel, but I feel like eventually um, our community will get back to a point of where we're able to thrive and where um, there's black owned businesses and black owned churches um, and things of no, those natures thriving because um, we, we see that there's a need for that. We need to see that there's a need for um, spaces for black people um, created by, by black people. So uh, I, I think eventually we'll get back to that. Thank you so much, Anaya. We're gonna wrap it up in a few minutes but I would be remiss if I did not allow you to take just a couple of minutes and talk about your programs at your respective schools and what being a Cheatham White Scholar means to you that um, at your school and some of the things that you might be doing. Um, since A&T went first last time, I guess I'll go first this time. <laughs> and um, I, it is February 1 now, you know, it's February 1, 
And, 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 am I right, Aggie? but yes um i'm truly amazed um at all of the work that um nccu cheetah white has done um we have so many different students who come from diverse backgrounds just you know coming with one goal and that is to achieve excellence um we have someone in our program who's interested in music and um jazz and she really you know I feel like Cheatham White has allowed all of us to express our creative ability as well as it's helped us achieve our goals. Um, I know the transition from high school to college can be very difficult, um, but I will say that with being in this scholarship program, um, it, it was a more than, I wouldn't say more than easy, but it was less difficult than I would say someone might have if they weren't able to come in. I came in with 18 different other students. You know, I pretty much had a family coming in. Um, and, you know, I think it's funny. I, um, me and my uh, cohort, we kind of laugh and bond all the time about the fact that um, before we were able to um, get on campus and fully uh, merge in college um, life, we had to go on a week long camping trip. Um, and that is something we laugh and bond over because um, it it was quite rough. But, you know, it was one of those things that, you know, brought us closer and really made us feel like a family. And I would say that this program feels like a family. We have group chats with each other. Um, if there's a problem, we talk to each other. And it's, it's really given us a support system. Um, as far as um, what we're doing, um, I don't know if you all have seen, NCCU just um, is about to release on February 12th, a documentary about our basketball team. Um, and I'm grateful to say that I was able to be a part of that ESPN documentary. Um, and I actually spoke on the importance of the inauguration um, and what it means to us as an HBCU. Um, so I definitely think um, all of our Cheetah White scholars are making strides both within our community towards their own personal and professional growth. Um, I definitely think that without this scholarship program, um, you know, it, it might've been more difficult for us. So I'm extremely grateful and I think everyone is, is as well. Yeah, I can go next. Um, so I'm a Cheatham White Scholar at North Carolina a and and in our program, um, similarly, it just feels um, like a like a family a lot of the times. I know that the Cheatham White Scholars were the first people um, who I met on campus and before I came to campus. So just having a group of people around you just to empower you um, and to push you as a student and as a person and uh, just be there to support you is, is a really cool experience. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, Cheatham White has certainly uh, pushed me personally um, and allowing for me to have opportunities like this. Um, just to engage with with my community in ways that I hadn't before and, and just to be um, to just to learn and, and grow as a person as well. Um, as, as far as what I'm doing um, this semester um, and, and in the future as well, Cheatham White has helped me um, get an internship this next summer, just having that experience with Land Lakes, um, and then also just having the opportunity to also intern with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. And I have Cheatham White to thank for that, um, not having to worry um, so much about you know tuition and things like that, that I'm able to actually really focus um, and develop myself as a person, as a leader, I, I think is definitely something that has helped progress me. So, yeah. As has been stated previously, the family aspect of the Cheetah White Scholars Program is unparalleled coming in um, with a group of people that you already know. Uh, my best friends today are you know, also Cheetah White Scholars, so it's really a family environment that continues throughout your entire college experience. Um, I would say that Additionally, just having those students with you to support you academically uh, and professionally. You know, we all come in, we're here to get education. We already are high achieving students. We know how to get our work done. We know what our goals are for the future and we can support each other to, to get where we want to go next, whether that's graduate school or a full-time career. Um, I think also you have additional opportunities as being a part of the program. So whether that's meeting the chancellor, going to events such as this. Um, last year, I had the opportunity uh, or actually two years ago now, to go to DC for the Congressional Black Caucus, their annual conference. Um, they started an HBCU brain trust and I was able to uh, network with some um, people in Washington DC and other uh, leaders in black organizations. Um, so that was a great experience. And just being able to really, uh, I think it just gives a heightened uh, sense of really being able to enjoy your college experience, um, knowing that you, are able to have this group of friends and all these opportunities that will prepare you uh, for your future. 
Well, I just wanna thank you so much, uh, young people for participating in our program. We are tremendously proud of you and we know that you will carry on that tradition and make us even more proud. So thank you so much for coming. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Mr. Williams. We do have some small um, gifts for you and we'll talk about that offline. And thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Well, uh, thank you, Ms. Danita Mason Hogan. And um, wow, uh, so much thanks to the young people, the students. I, um, I just, I'm not gonna say much because I want what you all brought to the table to resonate with folk after we end this um, program. Um, I do want to just briefly say, and I think it's part of the promotional material for the program that, you know, after George H. White left uh, Congress, after uh, he left, it was not until 18, uh, 1929 that another black person, I think that was maybe Oscar the Priest from Chicago maybe was elected Congress. It was not until 1992 uh, that, uh, that Eva Clayton was, was appointed and eventually ran and was elected to Congress here in the state of North Carolina. George H. White left, but he didn't give up. He went on to found a, a bank, um, he went on to found a town. He went on to continue work to try to get dignity and respect for his people. And, you know, it was a perfect decision to end this program with, um, with our student scholars because they leave me with inspiration, hope, and energy. So thank you all so much. And um, I wish everyone a, a good night and a good evening. Take care. Okay, that's it. I'm gonna um, contact your um the heads of your department your directors because like i said we have some stuff to share with you so if you would look for that email tomorrow that'd be wonderful and you should all be so proud i know everyone who was watching this was proud of you and uh just thank y'all so much and we um it was very nice i read your book um mr justinson a long time ago and it was um it was really illuminating and it was so good to read about this man who needed to be uplifted for a long time, who's kind of left out of the historical narrative. So thank you so much for doing that. So um, I enjoyed it. Y'all go, and I, uh, I know you have to run off anyway, but um, I just want you to know that I'm really proud of you calling us anytime and we'll continue to brag on you.